Well, D-Lib time has arrived, and I don't mind telling you, I was pretty nervous going into this thing. Taking a brand new chip, voiding the warranty, putting it inside this little plastic block, and then cranking this Allen key down until you hear a pretty loud snap, and then hoping you don't screw anything up. You're looking for cheap PC games? Check out Kingwin.net. Click the link in the description below to help support the channel and never pay full retail again. Yo, I'm Brian P. You're watching Bad C Tech and what's really good? So I'm not gonna waste a lot of time today crafting a tutorial about how to do a D-Lid. There are literally tons of these on YouTube if you wanna see the process for yourself. Today I'm gonna be solely focused on results and see if I can hunt down that elusive 5.0 gigahertz overclock I'm looking for. Now I use the Rocket D-Lid kit for this one. I gotta tell you, this is just purely fear of the unknown. In practice, this thing is really a piece of cake process, provided that you do a few things first. Number one, make sure you invest in the right tools, watch some tutorials, make sure you feel pretty comfortable with the process. Get all your tools in front of you all at one time so you don't have to get up and go chase stuff down because once you get under the hood of this thing, you really don't want to walk away from it. Give yourself plenty of time and make sure you focus on the task at hand. The only real sticking point here for me was working with the liquid metal itself. For reference, I use Cool Laboratories Liquid Pro. It's just a really weird compound to work with if you never have before. But being a constant offender of putting way too much thermal paste on a CPU, I had to make sure I was very reserved in my application of liquid metal here. I was very careful to make sure that I got rid of all traces of any pre-existing sealant, both on the heat spreader itself and on the die, because I'd read numerous places that this can lead to the heat spreader not sitting 100% level. Obviously, that's gonna affect temperatures. And I was pretty ginger when I was cranking down the set screw as well. I didn't know how much pressure that lid could take, so I just kind of cranked it down to just a little bit more than finger tight. I was afraid to really lay into it. So after a couple hours of cure time, what I was left with was a complete CPU that if anything was a little bit spongy, i.e. you could like squeeze down and kind of see a little bit of motion in the silicone sealant between the lid and the substrate itself. I was a little concerned, but I thought that the pressure of the socket and the subsequent pressure of installing the cooler on top of it would probably overcome that. Now for testing, I used Prime 95 as a torture test with small FFT enabled. This thing really beats these CPUs to death. You can pretty much rest assured that if it'll run stable under Prime 95, it's gonna run stable under just about anything you could possibly throw at it. I also used hardware monitor to make sure that the voltage I requested in BIOS was actually being delivered to the chip, and I got a good package temp from there. For individual single core temps, I actually use the program Core Temp because I feel like it gives a more accurate single core temp. And for performance benchmarks, I use Time Spy. For reference, the cooler I'm using here is the Be Quiet Dark Rock Pro 3. I'm also running 16 gig of DDR4 memory clocked at 2666, and the GPU is a 1080 Ti Founders Edition running at stock clocks. So prior to D-Lid, I was able to achieve an overclock of 4.9 at 1.3 volts with 5.0 being just out of reach because of thermals. I was able to get that done with an idle temp of 51 degrees, and under load of Prime 95, it saw both a single core and a package max of 94 degrees. Now because Prime 95 works this CPU so much harder than seriously any game you could throw at it, or even video rendering, it's not an overclock I would have run and felt comfortable with if it was gonna push that CPU to the levels that Prime 95 did. But you can really expect about a 15 degree difference in everyday use, so I was comfortable with that overclock. If I tried even so much as bumping that thing up to 1.31 or 1.32, trying to chase down that five gig overclock, I saw a temp spike to 100 degrees under Prime 95, no sweat. So, moment of truth. Same run, 4.9 gigahertz, 1.3 volts, idle temps now of 43 degrees, and under load, under load was 77 degrees max for single core and package temp. Yeah, bro. So naturally, I immediately cranked it up to 5.0 gigahertz at 1.35 volts to see if I could finally get that 5.0 and nailed it. Happy to report I was able to get that stable, no sweat, with a max single core and package temp of 85 degrees. So from here, I decided to dial back the voltage in increments of 0.01 and see how low I could go to maintain stability. It would hold stable as low as 1.32 volts, but the time spy score I put up was only 44.50. That's like half of what I expected to see, so it would definitely need some more juice. But after some testing, the chip put up its best numbers at 1.34 volts with a max package temp of 84 degrees and it posted a time spy score of 9561. That's more like it. So, what a huge success. Oh, whoa, 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 hold the phone there. I noticed in my testing that Core 2 was repeatedly putting up on average two to three degrees and in some cases four degrees higher than the next closest core. It tells me I got a hot spot. It tells me I either didn't put enough liquid metal on the die, 
I was sloppy with the sealant or I didn't tighten the set screw down far enough in my relid process. This would have bothered me forever, so let's take it from the top. Now popping the top on this guy for a second time saw that, yeah, it was probably a little sparse with the liquid metal. So this time on application, I left it with a nice glossy mirror sheet across the top. My first application, the lines where the applicator we used were really obvious. So this time, just a nice smooth sheen over the top. I was also really careful, very minimal with the sealant this time, and I applied a little more pressure with the set screw. So here we go again. And totally corrected the issue and yielded some better thermals. Now at 5.0 at 1.34 volts, I saw a max package and single core temp of only 80 degrees running under load with Prime 95. And we're running Time Spy or rendering videos, I saw a max temp of 65 degrees. Now amazingly, this correction also saw the chip running at 5.0 stable at 1.31 volts. Here I thought I had a dog of a chip the whole time, and the only issue was the thermal interface material. At 1.31, I got a 9560 out of Time Spy. Now these scores increased incrementally as the voltage went up, with 1.34 providing the best scores and 1.35 not showing enough variance to make it worthwhile. So 5.0 achieved. Can it do 5.1? Yep. At 1.4 volts, it hit 87 degrees in Prime 95 and a Time Spy score of 95.74 at 71 degrees. I didn't really want to go higher than 1.4 because it's a pretty big jump in voltage, but what I feel would be pretty insignificant gains in gaming and rendering. It's more just like knowing that you could. It's worth noting, I got 5.1 to hold stable as low as 1.38 volts but the time spy score dropped about 20 points per 0.01 decrease to voltage. And 5.2, well, despite motivating my CPU the best way I know how, Let's go, baby! You know what time it is! Push it! Push it! It just wasn't gonna happen. Not at 1.4 volts, not at 1.42, and I really wasn't willing to push any harder than that. So, final results. I settled on a 5.0 gigahertz overclock at 1.34, with a 95-97 time spy score, a max prime 95 temp of 80 degrees Celsius, and a real world operating max of 66 degrees. Now, I actually could have pulled a 64 degree max operating temp here, but I decided to sacrifice a couple degrees of temperature to knock down a few decibels of noise coming off my CPU cooler. I didn't bother running down a whole suite of benchmarks again because honestly, the performance difference between 4.9 and 5.0 is nominal. But mentally, what I wanted out of this chip was 5.0 on air, and that's what I got. And that's 100% because of the D-Lid process, which is also responsible for giving me a 20 degree drop in temps under load. Super, super impressive. So on one hand, wow, what a cool experience. I know it sounds weird, but I feel like I have an even greater sense of ownership with this chip having completed this process. Plus I gained a new skill. Well, on the other hand, what the f Intel? You seriously can't spring for a soldered on IHS on a K-Series chip? You sell these chips specifically to overclock and you roll them out nerfed because you cheaped out on the thermal interface material? It makes zero sense to me and I sure hope this chip has a long life because my warranty is out the window. A big shout out to my dude Keith for hooking it up with the Loner Rocket D-Lid kit. And that's it for this time. I'm Brian P. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to hit that like button, hit that sub button, and until next time, stay up.